Thanks here, Mr. Tyson. You're going to cover uh, real estate um, RP data and uh, feasibility studies real quick, getting together and how we use that. Ty's now fully licensed real estate agent, does commercial property, and you might get a chance to come and do some transactions. We're gonna, after this, we're going to do a little bit of commercial stuff, and uh, he's the man. So let's give him a big hand again. Well done. Cool. Thanks, Roy. What's up, everyone? Okay, so, so how this usually goes is when I say, what's up, everyone, you've got to say, what's up? Okay, let's try that again. What's up, everyone? What's up? All right. That's what we're talking about. So like Roy said, it's broken into two parts. This presentation, I'm going to talk about RP data and then how we incorporate the feasibility into that. Uh, I've got a very short time this afternoon. I um, have to shoot up and check out some properties in Coomera. So I'll give you as much value as I possibly can. And uh, I'll speak as slowly as I possibly can while speaking fast at the same time, OK? <laughs> so we'll get this uh, presentation up here. And uh, you might want your little notepads, because I'm going to give you some absolute gems in this uh, next half an hour to 45 minutes. So let's look at feasibility and RP data, the tools you need to know to succeed in real estate investing. OK. Let's dive in and take a look. So the first part of this presentation is made up of the four-point race. Now. Um, after this program, you'll have plenty of opportunities to you know, talk to the coaches within the One Life crew and also Roy's mentoring program as well. Now, when you bring a property onto the mentoring program, I'm on there, Harry's on there, and Roy's accountant, financial planner, they're all on there. And uh, if you want us to give you the most help, you'll need these four things. Okay? So let's bring up number one. The first thing you'll need is RP data and feasibility. And I'm going to actually go into step number one today on what you can achieve using those two tools. The second part is analysis. And analysis is looking at the RP data and feasibility, what story it tells us, and then how we can use that story to benefit us. The next one is council codes and regulations. Who lives on the Gold Coast in the room? Yep, most of you. All right, well, the Gold Coast City Council are actually fantastic. They supply everything on what we call a local area plan, and I'm not sure if it's uh, the same whether you're from Victoria, Brisbane, or wherever, but a local area plan here on the Gold Coast is what it's called, and you can, you can put into the website any coding, or sorry, zoning. Who knows what a zone is? All right, well, in Queensland, they call zoning a domain. So you can put the domain into the website, and it'll actually give you a whole full plan of what you can do from what you can't do. It's as simple as that. And then we, we have a lot of people that come on to mentoring, tell us all about this fantastic property, and then we get to the end and they haven't done any research on whether they can actually subdivide, whether they can do this, can do that. Yeah? Is everyone following me on this? All right, and the last one is entry and exit strategies. So with these four things, when we talk to you on a mentoring call or when you talk to one of the team or one of the coaches, these four things can actually give us a decision on whether you should put an offer in on this property or not. Yeah? All right. Just nod your head like this if you're getting me. Yep. And if you're not nodding your head, just nod anyway, and you'll, it'll come. It'll come. OK. Well, RP Data is a fantastic tool. And if you don't have it, I would recommend you do get it or buddy up with someone that does. And uh, I'm just going to show you quickly what RP Data can actually do. So when you get your login, the first thing you want to do is come to rpdata.com and you want to go to this little tab here, Try RP Professional. RP Professional is the new and updated RP Data, uh, and they're one and the same thing. Okay, everyone thinks, oh, do you get RP Data Professional for free? RP Data Professional is actually taking over RP Data. It's as simple as that, yeah? So they're all migrating over. Uh, and then once you come in here, you can put in your login details as so. And then this is the front page that you'll come to. Okay, this is your trophy case page. That's what I call it. Who has a Facebook in the room? All right, my name's Tyson Whitewood, so you can add me when you get home. Okay, but um, what they've done is they've designed this entire thing around the whole social media buzz and how it's just getting, you know, they're almost streamlining the entire process because they know that there are 700 million people, or 800 million, sorry, now in the world that have a Facebook. So let's make this kind of user-friendly and as Facebook as possible. So all you need to do here, so this is the front page. You've got all your different activities that you can do. Uh, you have 
some very important tools here that I'll talk about a little later um, in this presentation. You've got CMAs, which we'll also talk about. We'll go down and have a little look at what's down the bottom. So it provides all these different statistics. You can actually change this page and model this page however you want it. Okay, so you can take things off, put things on. They've got widgets galore on this thing. Okay, so let's take a look at the first thing. We've got CMAs. Who knows what CMA stands for? Yes, comparative market analysis. Okay, that is true. Uh, now, we as a real estate agent would use this if we were going to appraise your property and give you an indicative price of you know, what you should sell it for, yeah? Who's sold a house in the room before? Okay, so you kind of know what I'm talking about. This is a very, very important tool that agents use. I think it costs something like uh, $80 if you wanted to get this done, but this, you can get as many CMAs done as part of your subscription as you want, okay? Now, they're all logged in here, so I've done kind of three that you can see, but I've, I've done many, many more, and they're all logged in there. The next little part is my watch list. Now, as a real estate agent or as an investor, you, want, you have specific properties that you're going to target, yeah? Yep, that, fit, that might fit. So basically, you can put all those properties and store them in this little watch list part here, and as soon as they come on the market for rent or for sale or anything happens with it, it'll just kind of give you an alert and say, check me out, something's happening. The next one is, oh, here's your alerts here. So the properties that you have in there, it'll come up either listed for rent or sold. And I'm going to give you some wicked tips on, on how real estate agents kind of get get their watch list and everything up. And then this is just a quick little button on all the different things that you can do. There are only three of those that are probably the most important part. And then we're gonna make a start here and we're gonna put an address into the top um, and, it, and it just pops up with all these different options. So I want the one in Burley Waters, which is not far from here. And when I click on the one from Burley Waters, it comes up with this, okay? So we have all the basic details, sale price, sale date. Do you think this is important information to know if you're an investor? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, and then you've got your local zoning, residential A, and like I said, we'll talk about the council um, website a little later. You've got your owners, okay? When you're in the commercial market, ownership is, the, knowing the owner's name is very, very important. Uh, you've got sales history, and that'll basically tell us everything. Now, I'm gonna go through the three most important parts on this page. So, number one is called a CMA. What's number one? CMA. What's number one? CMA. Very good. Comparative market analysis. Number two is AVM. What's number two? AVM. What's number two? AVM. Okay. AVM stands for Automatic Valuation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the M stands for, so I <laughs> kind of just popped that on the end there. But it is an automatic valuation. Uh, now, one thing with the automatic valuation there, it's called an AVM, is Commonwealth Bank use that report internally. Okay? Now, am I saying that you can use that report and go and you know, get it valued up at that? No, I'm not saying that. However, they have had cases where the bank has accepted an automatic uh, valuation. Okay? So what's number one? CMA. What's number two? What's number two? What's number one? CMA. All right. Very good. And the last one is RP Data Map. I'm not going to get you to say it because we get R starts here and an R there and R there and all this kind of R, R, R. So uh, RP Data Map, okay? The RP Data Map I'm going to also show you. So let's quickly just check out the bottom of this page for sale and for rent. Now, these give us obviously a few hints. Um, we've got one here, oh, hints, sorry, as you say in Australia. Um, but uh, a couple of hints here. So this is currently for rent, $450 a week. Okay, is that a clue? If you were to buy this property for $450,000, what kind of yield are you looking at? 5%. 5%, yeah? All right, very good. And it just basically tells us another thread to the story, if you want to put it that way. So we use all this information, and we're going to collaborate it very, very soon. So let's actually jump into what a CMA looks like. This is when you click on the CMA button. What's number one? CMA. Okay. So when you click on the CMA button, you've got all these tabs at the top here that explain to you the exact process, step by step, on what you've got to do. So first thing you have to do is 
select sold properties. Yeah? So these sold properties are the ones that are comparable to yours. That is the most important thing in this entire process, properties that are comparable to yours. It'll only come up with properties in the last 18 months that have sold, so look for the ones that are comparable to yours. You can filter your search by all that you see on the left-hand side here. So you've got business, land, community, units, commercial, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, you want to choose properties that are comparable to yours, yeah? So there's a couple of quick hints. Our property here that we're looking at is 660 square meters. So these ones, 811, 714, if I can see it correctly from here, and so on and so on. That's a quick little indicator for you. And then the other one, you can obviously see here that this is a unit complex. So it's not going to be comparable. However, it's, it's selected. So you must unselect those ones. Okay? And you can unselect them all and start by, by yourself. Um, the next one here, it'll, once you click next step, it'll go on to select on the market properties. So the CMA, all it does is take everything that's sold, everything that's currently on the market, puts them together, and it'll give you an indicative price range of what your property's worth. That's what the CMA does. Yeah? Everyone cool with that? Nod your head. All right, very good. Okay, then the next part is looking at select market comparison. That's looking at which properties and how long they've actually been on the market. Is it important to know whether a property has been on the market for 365 days? Right. Well, I can tell you it's an everyday thing that I'll see a property more than 365 days right now in today's market. It is everywhere. And what does that tell you as an investor? There's an opportunity there. Like Roy says, like Roy says don't look for good sites, look for problem sites. Yeah? So um, that, that's what the select market comparison does. And then obviously we can preview it, and then you can generate, generate it in a PDF or so on and so on. Um, the final thing that I'll add on the CMA is that it allows you to customize, because if you, if you print it out as it is, it comes out in about 20 pages. It's like this massive kind of thing. Now, what I do if I'm speaking with owners of properties or my own property dream team, I don't want to overwhelm you know, my owner. So I, I can take out everything that I want and only give them the five pages that matter. Whereas with my team, there are specific things that we need and what we look for to you know, tell us it's a good deal, and I can chop and change and do all those kind of things. So I actually have different templates that say, all right, print for my team, and it'll only print me out the data that I want that I show to my team. Yep, everyone following this? Yes, good. And then on the other side, I can do it for my owners. So that is the CMA, and I'll answer any questions that you have at the end, so just write your questions down, uh, and I can take you through that. Um, other than that, a quick little mention, if you've got an iPad, is there anyone that's not have an Apple device yet in their household? All right, get with the program, team, okay? <laughs> but uh, the, the Apple iPad um, actually lets you do this. So if I was to present, if I was to come to your property, Mark, Okay, if I was to come to your property, and Mark might think the property's worth 500000 but I'm kind of, you know, I know that it's probably worth maybe four fifty. yeah? Just, just kind of saying. Now, I'll bring my iPad, and what I'll do is I'll sit down with Mark. Rather than me doing the CMA, shoving it in front of his face and saying, this is what it's worth, I sit down with Mark, and then on the iPad, it actually gives a sliding scale um, tool, and I, I let Mark choose all the properties that are comparable, and he can tell me whether his property is worth more or less than that particular property. And then what it does at the end is it obviously spits out a number, and that number wasn't generated from me, it was generated from Mark. So it maybe makes owners or vendors think a little differently, oh, wow, I thought my property was worth this, but it might be actually worth this. Now, why am I sharing that with you? Because as an investor, I can do a CMA now in two minutes flat with an iPad right there on the spot, bang, 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 okay? It's very, very quick. I can email the report off within seconds. It's that easy. So that is your CMA. What's number one? CMA. Very good. This is number two. What's number two? AVM. AVM. What's number two? AVM. AVM. What does it stand for? Automatic Valuation Moon. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So this is what you get. As soon as you press that button, it'll say, you know, accept terms and conditions. You press accept, and then it'll just spit this report out. Okay, you get 20 free a month, if I'm correct, um, with, your, with your membership. And here's the estimated value for this property, 486000 
a couple of key things to note on this page is the most important part is this thing here called forecast standard deviation. Basically, it tells us at the moment it's positive or negative 6%. So that's the value, and it could go up or down 6%, and that is actually a very strong indication of what it's worth. You get some that are 20%, and then you know straight away that there's not enough sales data to give us. But basically, the more sales data, the less that number will get. And the banks will, well, Commonwealth Bank in particular, would pay specific attention to that. And if they see 6%, they're thinking, OK, well, this is, could be around the right price. Yes? So that's, that's a big thing to look for. The other interesting thing that real estate agents do, there is a rule of thumb that says that every seven years, uh, someone, you know, life, your life cycle almost changes, so to speak. So seven years, it kind of just flows on and on into different things. So what, what they would actually do, and this is what we've done in our office, is you can see here 2011, there were 172 sales in this particular suburb. Everyone following? Yes? Okay. So 172 sales. So what they would do is they would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And they'll say 2004, there were 256 sales. So what they would then do is find all 256 sales and start calling. That's how they do it. They start calling and they say, no, I noticed, you know, you've been in your house for seven years, lots of things change, kids grow up, they go away, they do this, they do that. Were you thinking of selling? And you, you obviously it's a bit of a kind of hit rate sort of thing, catch 22. Some would say no, some would say, actually, I am. Okay? So you can, you can take into account the same thing. So this, this little part here is also very, very important. And you can do, so those are houses, those are units. All right, well, I'll quickly ask, answer the question. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the questions after this. Um, but just with this quick one, the question was, can you get the owner's details and the numbers and everything from RP Data? Uh, not all the time, no. Phone numbers, no. However, generally, they do have the owner's name and so on and so on. But I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that after this. The next part is the RP Data map. OK, this is what the RP Data map looks like. You've got all your different things that you can do up here. Everything, can you see everything that's ticked? Yep, can you see those things that are ticked there? That's what the map show, is showing right now. So as we go through, you've got find ownership, find sales. We can add dimensions around this property to find out what, you know, what the length is from there to there, what the length is from there to there, and then eventually calculate the area of this place. Um, on labels, we can find out what the lot plans are, what the area is, street address, owner's name, zoning code, land use, sale and details. On the search, we can search by company name, surname, street number, plan number, the whole thing. And then this is probably the most important part, which is all about themes. And this shows us, this will highlight for us 12, the sales in the last 12 months, 12, 24 months, and 24 and 36. And it looks something like this. Everything in red is everything that's sold in the last 12 months. Everything in orange is the last 12 to 24. Okay? And then I've moved the map over, and it is seriously as quick as this. Um, unless you live out at Bonogan and you have very bad internet out there. Um, but if you've got decent internet, basically it, it's as quick as this. So I've got now all the property details so you can see how much they've sold for. Now, this is my property here. Okay, and I'm looking at these ones. Okay, 317 in November 2010, 480 in October 2010. So I'm looking at those thinking, okay, there's a bit of action happening. Now I want to take another look at something else, the area, 660 and 660. Right? So I start thinking, okay, well, let's take a look at this property and find out why it achieved $480,000 sale price not so long ago. So I just click on that property, and it comes up with the same page that you had on the last. And I look at, OK, it's 480000 It's sold October 2010. Um, it's got the same resi code as mine. Um, you know, got different owners and stuff. And what I actually did with this particular transaction was cycle through the pages and actually found that this was a much superior property to mine. Very, very. And wh who remembers what uh, the AVM was for this property? It's like 486. And 
they sold for 480, which is 6,000 less than what mine was worth, and they've got a pool. And I actually went through the pictures, and this house is way, way better. So if I'm looking at my property and thinking, wow, I want to buy it, and then I want to sell it, and then I want to achieve a high price so I can make a profit, is there, are you all starting to see? Yeah? Yes? How this, how this powerful tool can actually help you. And I haven't even left the house yet. Okay? So that's something on that one there. And then I checked out the sales history. And I eventually checked it out. This property was on the market for a very, very long time. And as you can see, they started up at the uh, 5... Is that 85? 95. 595. And they went right down to 480 was the eventual purchase price. And that told me again, all right, if I'm going to buy this property and I'm going to do all these improvements, how long am I going to stay on the market to achieve a price that will give me 20%, 20 profit? Okay? So at the end of the day, I, took, I still took all the data and I put it into a feasibility. So this is the second part, feasibility. Let's go in and take a look. The most important parts of the feasibility are the proposed development. Now, you can write these down because there's only three that are probably the most important part of this feasibility. The proposed develop, development cost, the developer's hard costs, and the land purchase price. So number one was proposed development. Number two was your developer's hard costs. And number three was your land purchase price. Okay. These three numbers make up 85% of this entire feasibility program. Now, am I saying the other 15% you know, is not essential? It absolutely is, especially if you're going to put an offer forward. But 85% comes from these three. I'll quickly explain. Up here, the proposed development is what you would sell the property for. Yep, everyone following? That's what you'd sell for. Developers' hard costs are obviously your improvement costs, so your renovation costs. If you're building, your build costs and all all that sort of stuff. And then the bottom one here is what you're going to buy it for. So you've got what you're going to buy it for, what you're going to sell it for, how much you're going to spend. Does that make sense? Nod your head. Yes. Yep. Cool. Proposed development is what we want to sell it for, or what we think it is. I'll get your questions at the end. Um, so what you sell it for, what it's going to cost, and what you're going to buy it for is down there. And then... The other 15% of the numbers is made up of the following. Okay, we have the DA costs, which are down here, and the overhead expenses. When you actually get a chance to sit down and go through this, you'll be able to see everything, so your architecture fees, et cetera, et cetera. We've got your sales agent. It's a very important fee, very important. Okay, we've got uh, set your targets. So this decides, okay, what margin do you want to, what margin of profit do you want to aim for? We generally leave it at 20% and would recommend, especially on your first transaction, you've got 20% or above you know, profit margin. Yes? Because if you change that profit margin, you can look up here, this transaction is showing a 70% um, return on your money, basically. If you come below that set target, it turns red, and that's warning bells sign, you know? Okay, so there's your warning bells. You do not want it in red. We would rather have it in blue. Uh, for profit. Then up here, you've got your cash, calculated cash return. At the moment, it says not met, but it'll say met uh, on your particular transaction. And then this little part here and also this here, they do not affect the end outcome of these numbers. However, they're there for you to strategize. What are they there for you to do? Strategize. Strategy is very, very important. And the last one is finance. And once again, that, those numbers in that little box will not change the end profit um, outcome at the top. However, it's just for your own personal use and breakdown. Um, and then we've got a suggested land price. So if I wanted to achieve, just so you can see this, if I wanted to achieve 20% on this transaction, I would have to buy it for negative 1.55 million. Now, this is obviously just because the numbers, and you will actually get it pre-filled in, and you have to ch chop and change as it is, OK? But uh, in, in realistic terms, when you actually do yours, it'll tell you straight away what you have to buy it for in order to achieve that set target. Is everyone following that? If you didn't follow that, I've actually made up this thing here. So right now, this is a, this is a video that I've made up. 
of myself filling in the feasibility for this property? So I thought there might be many, many questions. So uh, I'm hoping that I can answer it for you. So this is a video. There is actually sound coming out of this thing, but I've got my computer muted. So you, you have access and you'll have a copy of that recording on how to fill in the presentation. And soon I'm hopefully going to start moving you know, a, a thing around. There I am. There we go. Right? And right there I'm saying something like, you know, I'll put the address into the property, so on and so on. So is everyone okay with that? All right. Very good. So things to remember. And uh, here, the first thing you want to remember is the four-point race. So you've already got those little notes. And the reason that's so important is we don't want to waste your time. And especially when Roy's on a mentoring call or our own consultants are wanting to help you, you don't want to waste their time either. So make sure you have the RP data, you have the feasibility, you have all those things. Probably the hardest thing for the team is that when someone wants help with a property, they can't sit down for half an hour to do a feasibility, which makes it very, very difficult for them to help you. Okay? The four-point race. Second thing is purchase price, renovation price, sale price make up 85% of the feasibility. Okay? Next thing, use RP data and CMA to give you an indicative sale price for your property. And you can actually give this to... You can do it for other people if you want. You can charge them if you want. Or you can say, this is $120 worth of value. I'm giving it to you. you know? So uh, it is a very, very important tool. Uh, and just give the feasibility a go and share them on Thursday mentoring program. Okay? So I'm sure Roy will talk about the mentoring program later on um, over this weekend. But it's run uh, twice a month uh, on a Thursday, on a Thursday kind of fortnightly Thursday. And it is a super, super valuable tool that uh, you can use. And you've got access to Roy on the phone every second Thursday. Now, that's what Roy will talk about later on this week. Um, but other than that, what I'll do is I'll quickly take some questions. All right. Absolutely. Who's learned some things here? Yeah. Let's give a big one. Well done. OK, so someone had a question there. Put your hand up and we'll get a microphone. Go ahead. Mona. Uh, my question earlier was areas within the due diligence, which is your research before you, when you have your target area and what you need to know. The things that I did remember and did get down was zoning, medium price and maximum price um, within that area, what's on the market, so the properties that are for sale at present, uh, maps in the actual uh, suburb area and your target buyer, so knowing your media market. Is there anything else that you really need within the due diligence prior to doing the research? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we better carve out the next two hours because, um, no, I'd say what you basically said, and, and I was hearing a few different things, it was kind of a bit back and forth, that will get you started. And like I said, coming back to that four-point race, when you've got those four things and when you get, um, you know, the biggest thing I recommend is getting someone like Roy just to look over it. I mean, he's a, he's a fantastic strategist and he's done this, he knows what he's doing. So if you take those four points and you actually sit down with Roy and actually go through this, I can tell you now, by the end of it, you're either, it's either a good deal and you can go and make an offer on it or in most cases you've you've missed this or there might be something wrong with it or there's, there's something there. So coming back, I'd say the easiest thing would be the four-point race. Um, so your RP data feasibility, your, your analysis, so that's basically taking it into um, the feasibility side, your entry and exit strategies. So rather than passing Roy the monkey, actually coming to Roy with, well, this is what I think would work, Roy. What do you think? Because the only difference between you and Roy is that Roy has a, a, an entire memory bank. I've now figured this out. He has like a big, if you can imagine, a big, um, a big metal filing cabinet. And then you have this, you pull out the files and it goes for kilometres and kilometres, right? This is, Roy's, this is Roy's references to property transactions. So he can, at the snap of a finger, go, well, this, this block of land. And that's probably the best thing I've learned. When I started working with Roy, um, I used to be his jogging buddy, right? Actually, we didn't jog. It was like walk, run, walk, run, which is, I guess, a bit, you know... <laughs> Um, however, he asked me a question. He said, Ty, what do you see? And I said, oh, four walls and a roof. 
that's what I see. And then Roy would share something, this is what I see. And he could go through plenty of different, you know, he could rattle them off. So having, having someone like that actually go through the four-point race with you is invaluable. Um, and, uh, and definitely use that. Does that answer your question? Thank you. All right, we'll give, we'll give two snaps for that. Ready? All right, some did three. Point two on the four-point race is analysis. Can you talk to us a, more, a bit more on that one? All right, analysis, analysis. So analysis was basically looking at, um, it, it ties in, and that's why I had, on this side, and I had a little picture in the middle called planning and preparation and stuff like that. So analysis is like actually what I displayed of on that map. So, you know, looking at um, different properties around the room, uh, around, the, around the area. Uh, it also includes... Uh, this, here's an example. We had a property, uh, One Life property team, and we were looking at a site in Brisbane, if I remember correctly, um, and it was a bare block of land, and we thought, fantastic, you know, we could do DA approval for it and, do, and just get it done. At the end of the day, um, we didn't do anything with it, and uh, we actually found out directly across the road was a mirror image of this block, and they had already done the units straight across the road at what we planned. And uh, one vital key that we missed was actually um, the analysis part, in the analysis part, was we didn't actually drive around you know, the block to understand what is the best product or what product would real estate agents be very comfortable with selling. Okay? And we found in the area it wasn't units, it was something else, something else. But that's all part of analysis is doing the simple things. Drive around and find out, okay, well, I want to do a duplex here, but there's no duplex properties within, the, within a five kilometre radius. Do you think that'll be a good idea to build a duplex in a place where there's no duplexes? Absolutely not, okay? Um, analysis, and so basically you're driving around doing different things, you're using the RP data map, um, and yeah, I, I guess it's, it's looking at your rental stuff. It, it's just probably, there are a lot of, a lot of different things, um, but, but that's, that one principle is mainly looking at, you know, don't just look at the numbers you've got on Got to look a little wider. I'm sorry I couldn't give you specific steps straight off the bat, um, but you had a couple there, so that be good. Good job. Let's get one more question if someone else has got a question. That good, eh? That, that good. Well done. Give me a big one. Well done. All right. Now, Tyson, what Tyson's really doing in all this is a thing called due diligence. That's what this stuff's about, mm. being... Doing your due diligence, in fact, it's a little trick we use or a little strategy we use when we're doing properties. We buy time with due diligence. In fact, if those of you have seen what Kelvin did, what Merlin did, he actually got time to do his due diligence. He took an option and had 90 days to do his due diligence. That's why he was able to put all the bits into the ingredients to make that million dollars. And uh, what I've asked Ty to do after this now is a special thing. Excuse me, walking in front of you, Ty. On commercial property. I want to just change gear here on commercial property. We have a very big interest in commercial transactions. And this is a commercial transaction you're in. Tomorrow when we do our business area, I'm going to show you how we mix business and commercial transactions in together. Very, very powerful leverage strategy. So I want to just talk to Ty. Because now he's in commercial with Ray White. And he's doing transactions He's got, since he started, he's just been 32 listings in, in commercial transactions. So he's doing shops and offices and various things. It's a really good market now because there's got vacancies, the vendors are coming to, to, together with this. Uh, there is a market there, people need to move and grow and put their businesses in. So there's a really, really interesting market happening. Tyson uh, is specialising in, in, in some areas where if you look at it from a, the point of view of, a, um, of a, a real estate agent, they've often been given properties. And, and, and that property is, that's my vacant property, so that's what I want, that's my listing. And out there in the marketplace, there's specific, specific people who want properties. And the sort of things we've been working with is the 7-Elevens, the subways, the uh, pizza, pizza capers, you know, various ones that need property. If you can get into these transactions and become the owner and put them together like 
Kelvin did, there's a lot of money in this transaction. And Tyson is just talking to me uh, about this, and he's got some, he's actually built his own website to get inquiry to put these things together, because that's what he's doing. I'm going to recommend that there's some great opportunity for you in this. It's a fairly advanced technology, but a very, very interesting technology. So you want to talk a little bit about this? Yeah, well, I guess um, as a real estate agent, their scoreboard for you when you're, you know, kind of working in the office is the amount of listings you get. And, you know, I've got ton. The, 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 the motto is the more listings you have, uh, the, the, you're the top. You know, you're going to have all this property that you can sell. And the truth is that in a market like this, uh, it, it is actually very tough to sell things. Leasing is a bit better. However, leasing on the kind of all your small end businesses, you've got businesses that are failing, they're going out, and then small businesses coming back in, then they topple over. And, you know, so the lease thing's really, really good on the bottom end of the market. And uh, I basically looked at this and thought, okay, well, there's something, and I actually spoke with Roy about it, and, um, and we looked at Calvin's model and how that works. So I've started a, um, a website called uh, gcretail.com.au, and it's, it's, it's not launching for another week, um, but uh, this actually focuses on one principle. Who knows the biggest tenant in the entire world? All right. Most people say McDonald's. What, what percentage would say that? <laughs> so are there any five, five percenters percent. in the room? Yeah. One life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, any, any, any other? Does everyone know that McDonald's has 33,000 outlets throughout the world? Who's the biggest? Subway. Subway. Subway's Subway. taken them over. Yep. Is that an interesting piece of data? Mm. Now, looking at this model, um, you know, I decided, okay, well, there's something, obviously, that they're doing really, really well. Because McDonald's, I think they held the record since something like 77 or something, 1977, as the, you know, the biggest company. And then all of a sudden, Subway, how long have Subway been here? Not that long. And all of a sudden, they've surpassed them. And, you know, the speed, this acceleration is just going bonkers, and then you've got Coles and Woolworths who are opening up all over the place, and it's just going wild. So I've, do, I, I've looked at all that, and one of the key factors to Subway actually becoming a success in America and through Europe, etc., is they have this button on, my, on, my, on their website, on their main website, and it has submit a location. And what it actually allows, if you're a property owner and, have, and maybe have some property, you can actually put your details into it and within 24, 48 hours, they can come back to you and say, we're going to lease your property. This is how much we'll pay. Now, that, in my, that is just art to me. Now, they don't have that in Australia. So GC Retail is basically aiming at um, doing two things. Number one, my clients, whom I already have, are your 7-Eleven, your Nando's, your Subways, your Night Owls, all these kind of guys. So they're always looking for real estate. Number two is we've made on our website a submit, submit your location where owners can actually come in. Because at the end of the day, it's almost as if um, people don't sell real estate, real estate sells real estate. Okay? And, and the reason everyone thinks people sell real estate because you see them in the paper, you see these fantastic agents and they're doing all these things. But whoever saw all the, um, you know, you've got the new, I just got a call this morning. You've seen the um, approvals for the big jewel, all the new high-rises that are coming up on the Gold Coast. Most of those have already started leasing out, and you, you probably didn't even know that. Or you look at something like, uh, who know, who's seen the Oracle? Or been to the Oracle in Broadbeach? Okay, another fantastic property. Um, I know the agent who leased most of that out, and he, he already had that done. They didn't, they didn't come in the paper. They didn't go on, you know, they didn't do all these normal things. So... Real estate sells real estate, and people are there to basically guide them through the process. So that's what this, um, this kind of website is aimed to do, and um, it's got its clients are both the owners and the, um, the tenants, and just bringing them, bringing them together. It's a pretty simple idea. Very simple idea, putting two people together that want to deal with this. So you've got a property and you've got someone who wants to use it. What Tyson's done very remarkably is he's gone to these users and said, well, what's your need? And if you look at his, the Night Owl, Night Owl has a space, I think, from like 80 or 40 square metres up to like 80, has one model, has another one from like 180 uh, square metres to 120. One up here at T-Centres, I just measured it up the other night, just walked it through. It's a 
a, a 120 square meter site. And this is the one where you can go, you know, they're open 24 hours a day. And uh, this little box that they build has a, an absolute costing to it. And they take the, the, the head lease, they sublet it to their franchisee, who in turn pays whatever rent they want to charge them. And they control this exercise. And the poor unfortunate person who buys the franchisee buys a job. Now, I'm not knocking anything. I just want you to notice. You've got to take the, the vow that I will not buy a franchisee. I will not, be, I will not buy a franchise at all. Because this buying a job is very expensive. Pizza Caper charges $250,000 to fit the box up. You know, the box is like half of this room. Their new price is $320,000. They take 10% of that turnover in the transaction. You, you take 10% of turnover, what, what that can represent in profit to you could be more than 50% of the profit because turnover and profit are two different things. Turnover is the, the, the total amount. So this is great to be in the game of putting it together, but not in the game of the working the seven days a week and the 14-hour days. Who's following that conversation mm -hmm. with me? So what Ty has got is some very interesting technology around this. And uh, in our quantum property programs, we're taking not only the real estate trading area, we're also taking the commercial area. And we're working with Ty on this. He's also working with us on other transactions in Ballon. He was one of the original investors in the Ballon transaction. He learned a few things from that. Mm. Uh, so Ty's got some great bits and pieces. Let's get three high tips for what you've learned, Mr. Tyson. Three high tips for everything. Uh, for everything. Uh, number one would be, just give it a go, and uh, you will make mistakes. Hey, Shane, do you, did you find that picture? You'll find it, yep. Yep. Um, and just, just, just give things a go. So uh, <clears throat> this picture here shows me, guess how old I am in that, fi in that picture? <laughs> 16. I'm 16 years of age, and uh, this was my... My first business, it was called Hansel and Gretel Chocolate Creations. How many houses were you selling a week? 40. 40 houses. And building. So, that, so I, I'd actually, I actually missed school every Tuesday um, to, uh, to, on, my, on my last year of school. And uh, I actually went to real estate agencies. And uh, my, my opening line was, uh, you know, I'm a developer. And uh, I build and sell 40 houses a week. And, this, <gasps> and then I pull this thing out. It's a chocolate house, one kg of chocolate. Uh, and it's filled with roses. Okay, it cost us sixteen dollars to make. Uh, we sold them for fifty-five each. And sold it to the real estate agents. It was a present for any person who purchased a house. So they would give it to the to the to thank them because they made three or four, five, seven thousand commission. And his little gift. And Tyson would make the chocolate houses. So he was in real estate from sixteen making houses. <laughs> Tell them about the deal on the breakage tie. That was a good deal. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we had a big order from Christchurch. And it wasn't as shaky um, back then as it is now. And, um, and I sent 40 houses down. Now, the biggest challenge with this is we couldn't expand um, out of my city, which was Rotorua. Um, however, we finally got to, and, and I had to do the drop test with New Zealand Post. And, uh, and they were called Post Haste back then. But um, basically, I'd have, have a house in the box. And the drop test, I think, was 1.5 meters. We have to drop it. And if it doesn't break, then they would guarantee it. They would guarantee it if it doesn't break. And uh, they would guarantee it for cost, which was $35. Um, but if you heard earlier, it wasn't probably that. But basically, $35 is what they would pay me if they broke. So um, we, we passed the test, which was, you know, we reinforced that bad boy with so much chocolate. It was never going to break. Um, and then it didn't break. And then basically, we boxed 40 houses up, shipped them down to Christchurch. Uh, and then we got to the other end. Only one house survived. So what um, post... Post Haste did in their um, you know, entirety is they basically gave us $35 per house, sent the chocolate back, we remounted it, made the houses, and then sent it back down. <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh... And he was already into leverage. Who was making the chocolate houses for you? Uh, two 15-year-olds from my school. And how much were you paying per house? Five bucks a house. <laughs> See the leverage of this, this man. Got it very early. Mm. So, so yeah, give it, give it a go is just all about, you know, get out there and, and, just, and just do it. I mean, yeah. 
just give it a go. We, we kitted out. We ended up leasing this building. And, you know, I'm 16, so we didn't... This guy's just like, oh, yeah, just pay me this and rent. I'm like, cool. Um, we kitted out the whole place um, with everything from the dump. So we got our sinks. We got, I think my dad's a plumber, so he came in and, you know, did his thing, and it was all, it was all, it was all good. Um, but there was good chocolate. Though. Like, it wasn't, wasn't contaminated or anything like that. But giving it a go, we were kind of at that stage maybe a bit oblivious to what the laws were and, you know, having to have... Maybe a bit oblivious about the laws. <laughs> so that's number one. Give, give it a go. Number two. Give it two. a go. Uh, number two, um, strategies and planning. Uh, that, is, that is a big thing, and, and I guess goals would be very much tied into there. Um, and there's always, uh, what is it, whenever there's a will, there's a... Whenever there's a will, there's always a relative. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I love Roy's quote, you know, never change the goal, just change the strategy. Um, and there's, Never get when your goals change the strategy. Yeah. And once you've got your goal, just, you know, plan, keep going, keep going, keep going. And uh, number three would be the having a mentor. Uh, and, you know, I'm so grateful to have Roy as a mentor uh, and, and just having someone there to bounce your ideas off um, or even check your ideas, which is a very big thing. And I know Roy and I have had many meetings where I said, Roy, this is it. This is the plan. There is no other way. <laughs> and obviously in a couple of instances that, you know, maybe I... I uh, listen to Roy. Maybe I listen to Roy. Um, but yeah, at the, at the end of the day, it's you know, having that, that extra kind of wisdom is, is really, really helpful. And I can honestly say that I'm now better off having maybe not gone the way that I thought. And it's not that I'm turning away from, my, from myself. It's almost that I didn't know. It was a lack of understanding. And uh, when you've got a mentor who you trust, who is competent and has character, so Roy is very competent at what he does around this thing called money, and he has character. You know, he's a, he's a very good man. He sucks at computers, but he is a pretty good guy. <laughs> he is a pretty good guy. When the teacher's ready, the student appears, or when the student's ready, the teacher appears. When the teacher's ready, the student appears. It works both ways all the time. You think I'm grateful to have Tyson? He is a beautiful man, beautiful heart and stands for all our values in terms of integrity. I've seen this man walk away from transactions if it wasn't a win-win. I've seen him apologize. I've seen him, he always, he'll always do the right thing. He always takes absolute responsibility for his things. And our One Life team know him. They know of this about him. Very, very beautiful young man on a journey and doing really well. So we wish him well. Who's, who's learned some things here tonight? Let's give him a big hand. Well done.